Okay, aloha everyone. I'm Shenoa Farnsworth and I'm the managing partner at Blue Startups. If you're not familiar with Blue Startups, we're a venture accelerator in Honolulu, Hawaii. And we invest in and mentor technology startups, both from Hawaii and from outside the state. Uh, we have been doing that since 2013. Now, 11 cohorts and 82 companies under our wing. So um, if you want to know more about Blue Startups, you can get in touch with me, uh, or um, you can go to our website, bluestartups.com. Uh, it is my pleasure today to welcome Chris Hemeter of Bayer Ventures. He's been a great partner and friend of Blue Startups since the beginning. Uh, he's an investor in the travel space and more recently transportation as well. Um, and he'll tell you more about himself, but he has roots here in Hawaii too. So we're excited to talk to Chris today and get a feel for what's happening in the travel industry now and maybe in the future and perhaps forever changed. Uh, we'll see what, yeah. uh, what Chris has to say. And then uh, at the end, after his presentation, we will have time for Q&A. So um, hold on to your questions and, uh, and we'll get to those in a little bit. All right, Chris, take it away. All right, thank you. Well, it's great to be here, everybody. I, I wish I was there, however, enjoying the, the incredible, unprecedented lack of crowds sort of the double-edged sword of the uh, of this demand shock driven by coronavirus. So I'm, I'm gonna take you through some slides in a minute and I'm, I'm gonna breeze through them very quickly. Um, and then Chinoa will have a copy of the deck. So if anybody wants wants a copy afterwards, reach out to her. You can reach me, you know, Their Ventures website has my email address, chris at theirventures.com. Happy to engage after if I can be helpful in any way, would really be you know, happy to do that. And you know, I'll take you through just a, a brief overview of what we see happening in, in the space that we invest, a little bit more about why we're investing there and, and set up perhaps maybe some thoughts of, of where to from here. And then, and then we'll open it for, um, for questions. So uh, as Shinoa mentioned, born and raised in Hawaii, um, I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family and, and started joining the world of, of entrepreneurship um, in my early 20s, which means that I'm hopefully unemployable uh, and have spent my entire life creating uh, my own work, which has been, you know, a double-edged sword, but a great journey. And then about 10 years ago, um, started Thayer Ventures, and, and we are specifically a sector-focused small fund. We invest early stage, which in the world of venture means Series A. We're, we tend to be Series A, Series B which are companies that typically have about a million in revenue or more. In other words, they're past that um, early stage, seed stage, beta product, and, and are beginning to operationalize and commercialize their, their services or their tech. We are focused specifically on travel and transportation. Um, and, and one of the things that has been very important to me from the beginning of founding this firm is that we want it to be a true value added investor. So we've not only surrounded ourselves with a team that understands travel and transportation, but also many of our investors in our fund are uh, players in the space. So Marriott Hotels, the largest hotel company in the world, is a, is a limited partner in our fund, Hyatt Hotels, Enterprise Holdings, Host Hotels and Resorts, Travel and Transportation, a bunch of other companies from different parts of the industry. So. We like to believe that we understand some of the moving parts and some of the problems that are being solved in this industry. And, and we bring value to the companies we invest in by helping them make connections uh, and grow their sales, frankly. I think if you're gonna be a value added investor in a company, that means you better be able to open doors and help with business, business development, sales and strategy, which is what we do. <clears throat> so I'm gonna now share my screen and I'm gonna, assume that you can all see this. Yes, okay. <clears throat> so first, um, you know, why travel? Why, you know, why did we focus on this particular category? And, and I'm, again, I'm gonna breeze through this very quickly. I think as many of you know, it's one of the largest industries in the world. It's increasingly complex and dynamic, a very, very deep uh, and complicated value chain. It's also been an industry that has has historically been resistant to the adoption of technology. 
and because of a number of interesting sort of disruptive and dislocating forces over the last several years, that has been changing and accelerating. In particular, this industry, you know, very sleepy until the mid 90s and then completely transformed since then, right? If you think about the travel industry in the early 90s, they never took the, the online travel agency seriously. They subsequently, subsequently became a true threat to innovation uh, and to brand, frankly, in, in travel, which has led to now this sort of cascading series of disruptions and so forth. I can, I can uh, say for, for almost certain that 10 years ago, nobody in the hotel industry would have, would have seen Airbnb coming. Now, of course, they're a major player in the space. So a very interesting dynamic in travel. What does this all mean for an investor? It means, you know, here you have one of the largest industries in the world with a very complicated value chain that has only recently been facing extreme disruption and a history of resistance to adoption of technology. That's the absolute perfect formula for the development of startups and entrepreneurship. And, and that has true, uh, truly proven to be the case. I think as many of you know who have studied travel, it, it is a very complex ecosystem, travel distribution, the digitization of travel has been accelerating very fast across the entire shopping experience. There have been many, many, many interesting startups over the last 20 years that have disrupted this industry, and that has been truly accelerating. You know, along the way, there's been this great dynamic of consolidation by some of the blowout leaders. So, you know, again, if you think about an environment that's right for startups, you'd like to see something where there's a lot of opportunity to do good work. You'd like to see a very complicated value chain where there's many different points to do interesting things. You'd like to see an industry that's going through some level of consolidation. So the M&A activity is creating liquidity for startup founders and for investors alike, which attracts more capital. And then in the end of the day, it begins to attract more of the big horizontal tech companies that are coming in and buying travel assets. So again, sort of, you know, all of the things are happening around travel that makes this an incredibly exciting and interesting space. And then boom, right? We get hit with one of the most powerful, unprecedented shocks in business history. And if you were to have, if you had to draw a bullseye around industries that have been most affected by this shock, you'd have to say travel is one of them. So if we just sort of zero in on, okay, what does that mean in the US alone? I mean, these are staggering numbers. If somebody had shown you this slide a year ago and said, I think that there is a 0.1% chance that this could happen next year, you'd say absolutely no possible way. Yet here we are. When you compare hotel occupancies, ADR and overall rev par to prior year, the drop has been absolutely astonishing. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a painful, painful period for our industry and one that is not going to recover uh, quickly and is not going to recover tomorrow. And I think there's plenty of data that suggests that it, this is going to be a four, five year cycle to get back to 2019 levels in the broader travel landscape. But what does this mean to us, to innovators, to those who are investing in the digitization of travel? In a lot of ways, I think it means opportunity. Um, and before I sort of get into the rest of these slides, and this may come up in the Q&A, I would suggest that any part of the, the travel supply ecosystem, which is sort of what I just focused on, right? What's happening in the hotel sector, any part of that travel supply e ecosystem that was re resisting digitization of their business is no longer doing so. Uh, I can tell you for certain that the interest in software across the travel ecosystem has increased dramatically during COVID. Why? Because if you are a travel supplier, you fundamentally are broke. You have no idea when you're gonna break even again. Uh, you have no way of forecasting future demand based on what's going on now. You have to have technology tools that enable you to be the most efficient and the most productive you possibly can be. And you have to have access to as broad a swath of the market, at least in the top of the travel funnel as possible. So it's actually a very interesting time to be in the technology game in the industry that's being hurt the most. 
So what are some of the big and interesting trends that we see coming out of, of uh, this enormous shock? Well, one of them has been this absolute transformation of what it means to work. As you know, we've been undergoing one of the great experiments in human history uh, about remote work. And I am certainly not going to say that business travel is dead. In fact, I do not agree with that at all. And we can talk about that a little bit later, nor would I suggest that events and meetings are dead. Absolutely not. I believe that that's coming back for certain. But there will be now this sort of new accepted norm of the nomadic worker. And how does that affect travel and travel destinations? It could have very interesting ramifications for the kind of products that Hawaii, for example, could focus on, where it's you know long-term or mid-term stay products, even short-term stay products, but are more enabled to be remote work environments for people who want to just get the heck out of Dodge. So some interesting changes happening there. We've also really seen it in the, in the alternative lodging assets. And as an investor in Sonder, we can talk about the, the incredible difference between Sonder's uh, um, occupancy rates and their hotel competitors during this period for a number of reasons. We've also seen, of course, through this period, um, an incredible uh, sort of surge of you know, people engaging in, in, in digital platforms for all kinds of things that they do, whether it's, you know, banking, groceries, apparel travel, there has been an enormous explosion of trial. And some of the early data is suggesting that that sort of surge of digital trial is likely to convert to long-term participation. So, you know, if you think about industries, not just travel that have been affected by COVID, there is still going to be, in our view, this sort of acceleration and swing towards, you know, the e-commerce, e-commerceization of just about every industry on the planet, um, which is really interesting and is going to create many opportunities. And it's not just in the consumer side, it's also in, in the B2B side and how companies are using digital tools to engage. So again, for, for, in, for, you know, for software thinkers, for, for innovators, um, and entrepreneurs, this is a time, you know, it's extremely interesting, albeit painful and difficult. Very interesting. What underlies this is the same things that have been true even pre-COVID, which is, you know, the, the, the fundamental fuel that drives innovation is data, you know, data and analytics. Uh, there is no industry, no two industries, frankly, other than travel and transportation that are more likely to be affected by data and analytics. I think this is particularly true in the new world, because if you think about it, in 2019, the greatest objection that many travel suppliers had to analytics tools that helped them with their forecasting was, I don't need it, I'm doing well, and I'll just basically guess that I'm gonna do about the same thing I did last year. That's gone. There is absolutely no fundamental way to forecast travel demand based on prior year experiences. It's a new world. So you need to have tools that are much more real time, looking at the momentum of shopping uh, and not just booking, but shopping as well. Uh, and I would argue that travel's not dead. I mean, travel is, in a, it is definitely in a world of hurt, but it is not dead. And consumers, particularly in our country, uh, view travel as, as an entitlement. Um, People are bursting at the seams. They are absolutely going stir crazy and can't, get, can't wait to get the heck out. We think it's going to be leisure first. I think that's no, you know, nothing new about that. It's going to be drive to markets, which doesn't really help Hawaii very much. Um, but travel is just, it is pent up. When the doors open, the surge will be there. And I think given Hawaii's dependence on leisure, um, the surge uh, in travel will be intense. So enjoy the uncrowded beaches <laughs> while you can. It won't last forever. Um, and we see it in some of the booking data, um, you know, the, 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 the shopping and the destination um, uh, uh, data is really telling and, and a lot of interesting things happening. And so, you know, the big question is how deep and how painful is this, right? And, and do we have enough liquidity in the marketplace to, to sort of drive that catalytic change forward. And you know, at this point, it's just too difficult to say. And we really are at a very fundamental moment now where our government has to decide 
uh, if it's willing to use our borrowing power to truly drive, um, well, it's not actually to drive business forward, but it's to mitigate the damage, right? I mean, we have, as the United States, a virtually unlimited capacity to borrow uh, and invest back into our society, frankly, to keep the floor up, because frankly, that's the big risk. I think that the biggest risk to 2022, 23 is economic, not health. It is very likely that we will have treatments, we will have vaccines, we will have sort of moved through this period where the health factor will not be as daunting then. But if we don't do the right thing and drive liquidity uh, into, our, into our markets and, and into our society, um, then we'll be facing lingering economic damage that um, will will be around for some time. So hopefully, it, you know, I mean, and I frankly think that this is a pretty astonishing chart, right? That the dark blue circles are, you know, the kind of liquidity that governments put into their countries during the 2008 financial crisis. Remember the Great Recession? The blue dots are what has so far gone in just as a result of COVID. And I would expect that United, United States bubble is going to get a whole heck of a lot bigger soon, particularly in an election year where the economy is such an important thing for, um, for both parties, frankly. Anyway, so, so that's our take on the world. I think that, you know, in a nutshell, uh, the, the pain is real, unprecedented. It, you know, there's no sort of silver lining to any of the suffering that people are going through, but as long-term investors in tech and as entrepreneurs who are innovating in and around this industry, uh, the next several years could be one of the greatest windows of opportunity of our lifetime, um, which is a little bit ironic given how painful it is at the same time. So, you know, we are leaning in as investors. I would say one of the things that has changed in the world of venture capital is pricing. And a lot of people talk about that pricing being a function of the valuation of, of businesses now. And I think it's important that, you know, people understand that, that the reasons behind that, um, you know, it's not arbitrary. One of the greatest variables that we struggle with when we try to underwrite investments in companies is the variable of time, right? time sort of uh, to accelerate revenue, time to, before you get to the next fundraising need and so forth, time to exit. So in a world where the variable time is so uncertain, it has to be embedded in price. And so you're seeing more and more, more investors you know, taking an aggressive view on price. But again, it's not because investors are trying to take advantage of the suffering to get better deals, it's because truly, when you blow up the variable of price, um, you know where else is it going to show up? It's going to show up in valuation. So, uh, anyway, happy to take questions, and I'll stop sharing so we can get back to just us. All right, thank you, Chris. That was great. Um, the good and the bad, right? Uh, okay. Yeah. So if you have a question, you can uh, raise your hand and I'll uh, call on you or you can put your question in the Q&A. So uh, if you're feeling a little more shy. Um, so I can see uh, here we have some questions already in the Q&A. Um, so we'll go ahead um, and look at those for a second. Uh, Pia Arma, she says, what suggestions uh, what are what do you suggest are some of the actions that hospitality related businesses can take now to address the new normal? Well, I, I mean, it depends on, you know, when you say hospitality related businesses, there are so many different flavors of that. Um, but I would say that that, you know, all companies in the space right now have been struggling to come up with models that preserve cash. Right, and, and whether you're a tech startup or whether you're a travel supplier or a service company, you know, protecting your cash and figuring out how to get to the other side um, is absolutely everything. I mean, there's, it is very likely that there will be an enormous turnover of 
businesses during this time, whether we're talking restaurants or tour operators or others, there will be those small businesses that fail to survive, but the demand will be back. And so others will take their places. And I bet in six, seven years, we'll be looking at this environment and, and we'll be astonished by the, the amount of change, but we also might be astonished about how it looks the same as it did before. So if I'm an operator of any kind of business, in hospitality, I am just absolutely doing whatever I have to do to make it to 2021, when hopefully there'll be some resemblance of normal, at least some liquidity coming back into the marketplace. I'd say that that's the most single most important thing you could do. All right, so <clears throat> we have a question from CJ. CJ, um, we can hear you. Go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Chris, how's it going? So we saw you speak at Arrival actually back in the fall. So great to hear you talk again here. Um, we're a new company in the tour and activity space called Bubba Booking. And so my question is, in your opinion, what stage are tour operators at when it comes to implementing a booking system? Would you say it's early, majority, late, or laggards? And then, you know, what part of the country do you think is further along than others? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, the activities, tourist and activities space is sort of the, the next big frontier of digitization and travel and, and, you know, has been an incredibly exciting place for investors. And, and I think there's two sort of parts of it, right? There's the, <clears throat> the, just the implementation of some sort of a res system that can talk to the, you know, to the distribution side of the world. And then there's sort of this whole channel management layer and all of those pieces have been coming together. <coughs> Excuse me. I think pre-COVID, that seemed to be um, <clears throat> accelerating. I think that during the early days of COVID, there has been sort of a big pause. I think a lot of it has to do with just, you know, when there is no demand and your doors are shut, people aren't necessarily focusing on what to do next. They've probably been scrambling with <clears throat> acquiring their PPP loans and, and you know, deciding who they're going to keep around and who they're not and just sort of going through the motions of survival. But if, you know, my, my suspicion is that as the, the other side of the, of, the, of the bridge begins to emerge, or I should say probably the tunnel, um, that more and more suppliers are going to be highly focused on digitizing because they have to. They have to have the ability to reach as many you know, points of distribution as possible. So, it, you know, it, it, it's a difficult thing to say. There's still a lot of work to be done and it's an incredibly, you know, it's an interesting marketplace because it's not, you know, homogeneous, right? It's like the, the kayak operator is not the same thing as the water park, water park operator, which is not the same thing as the museum. So, you know, different, different components are, are behaving differently. But I still think it, I contend it, it's an incredibly interesting space. It's just not clear, you know, when the buyers are going to start really, you know, jumping back into the market and when the transactions are going to key up. Hope that was helpful. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Thanks, CJ. Um, Takaho, you have a question. You can talk now. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity. Uh, so my question is, um, have you seen a lot of startups and technology coming up for new normal, especially the new life with the corona in travel and hospital industry? If you do, uh, could you explain what kind of technology you think it's important for our industry or those travel industry to innovate? Yeah, no, uh, that's a, it's a really good question. And it's, so I think that there's been there's been sort of two flavors. There's been a lot of opportunistic jumping on the idea of cleanliness, right? And everybody has now changed their pitch deck to include some sort of, you know, hands-free, no-touch <laughs> storyline. And some of them, frankly, get pretty damn ridiculous. Okay, um, I don't know how long. I mean, is it a business to suddenly have an angle on cleanliness? I'm not so sure in four or five years when we've had a, you know, a vaccine and people are moving on from this, are they going to be obsessing about cleanliness? I don't think they are. So 
in my view, that alone is not a business. It's a good reaction. We might get, you might get a lot of companies that'll try you for a while. Frankly, I just don't see that as a long-term play. <clears throat> the, the, the companies that are, I think are really set up to thrive are the ones that are focusing on automation and productivity. At least in, in, the, in the hospitality industry where you know, labor is 40% more than 40% of the cost component of running a business, uh, figuring out how to change the model um, and use automation to frankly just um, you know, reduce labor that's not customer facing. I mean, that's many, many, the, the old hotel model was invented back in what, the turn of the century? Of the last century. Yeah, I was gonna right? say. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and, you know, and it hasn't changed much. And, and now, and it's been suffering under the weight of labor and that's been somewhat offset by the growth in RevPAR. But now there's an extreme interest in different types of models to, to manage labor. So I think that, you know, just, just efficiency um, you know, efficiency driven ROI is attractive and it will be for the long run. Cause I do think that the, that the industry will change the way it delivers its products now as a result of COVID, but it won't be because COVID is a health health risk. It, it, it will be because COVID blew the bottom out of the economic assumption. So everybody is now scrambling to figure out how to drive more flexibility into their business models. Chris, do you have any specific examples of things you've seen more recently that strike that <coughs> not being silly about the COVID response, but actually being thoughtful and, and you know, smart about the, their COVID response? Yeah, so, uh, so we have an investment in a software company called Opti, it's O-P-T-I-I, and it's housekeeping in back of house software, <clears throat> excuse me. And, you know, Opti has a number of you know, very sophisticated components to its software that help to forecast housekeeping labor better, help to actually schedule um, the time it takes to clean rooms, help to sort of eliminate the layers of supervision to make housekeeping more efficient. Um, and it's been a very, it's been a successful company pre-COVID, but as you can imagine, housekeeping in a world where RevPAR is growing, you know, like in 2019 levels, house, housekeeping wasn't on everybody's mind. Now it's on everybody's mind because cleaning protocols have gotten very extreme. Housekeeping is super expensive. It's one of the largest components of labor. So hotel companies are very keen. I mean, you, you frankly, it's, it would be irresponsible to be running a hotel and not using some sort of software tool to help manage housekeeping. So I think that's an example of a company that you know, is taking advantage of its productivity story in the face of COVID. We have another investment in a company called Lifehouse Hotels, which is a, a you know, tech-driven management company for small hotels, and they've really figured out how to use automation to get rid of back office financial reporting, layers of supervision, the kinds of parts of, you know, the components of, of labor in a hotel that aren't out dealing with guests. Um, and that was a really, that's a very strong model for small hotels, 200 rooms or below. And that company has been accelerating. And again, I, I, it's not, it's not so much that the COVID story suddenly, you know, enables that business to thrive, but, you know, in the, in the demand shock driven by COVID, it has created this opportunity for many real estate owners to think about hospitality differently. Could you say the name of hotel, uh, the company again, the business, the startup? It's called Lifehouse Hotels, like L-I-F-E, Lifehouse Thank you. Hotels. <clears throat> and then, of course, Sonder has been, you know, really accelerating, even though they've been impacted by the demand shock, there's been this really interesting shift to this, you know, shadow supply that companies like Sonder and, and Airbnb and, and Verbo and all the, you know, the others um, distribute and focus on. So, but I think that the, you know, so there, I've seen some, you know, companies that have been in the, in the business of doing one thing that have suddenly you know tried to change their story to be all about cleanliness or all about you know um the hands-free touch-free guest experience and i just don't see that as sustainable as a business model all right we have a question from irena irena you can now ask your question hi so my question is given that business travel is currently on hold 
do you foresee a boom in the travel industry being enticed by airlines and hotels for the leisure industry? Yes, I, I, you know, the, the um, in, in, in prior recessions where there, there's been some, you know, semblance of a demand shock, the Great Recession and, and, and recessions prior to that, leisure travel always recovers first. Um, and I think that there's no doubt that in this case, leisure travel is going to recover first and it's going to recover fast. Again, I think it's important to remember, this is not a systemic recession. This isn't like the Great Recession where something fundamentally is wrong with the economic engine that, and it needs to be rebuilt. Now, the damage could be so severe if this goes on too long that it, you know, we, we could get there. But at least in, in the psyche of, of the leisure traveler, um, you know, people are busting at the seams to get out there. And, and what we're seeing in some markets, some of the drive-to markets, and this is you know, good for travelers but not so great for hotels, is those markets that have very large hotels that have historically catered to group and meeting business, since that cohort is likely not to come back so fast, they're dumping price. Because you, know, you have a 600 room hotel, historically your mix might have been 60% leisure, 40% business. Now that business is gone, you've got a lot of empty rooms. And so they're dumping rate um, to try to get a larger and larger share of the leisure traveler. And that, that'll probably suppress rate across the board. Um, but that may be good for other suppliers and other players in the ecosystem, right? I mean, if you get that, if you get a bunch of people coming back, even if the hotel ADRs are low, that's still people who are driving hard dollars back into the economy, doing activities, going out to dinner, shopping at stores. Um, so I, I think that we will see that, and, and we'll see that as soon as the restrictions are removed. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sure. <clears throat> All right, we have a question that was typed into the Q&A from City Guide. The travel industry has historically been slow to adopt new emerging technologies. Do you think COVID-19 will accelerate the adop adoption of these technologies to mitigate the damage done to the industry? Yes. I, I mean, that, 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 that's, <clears throat> I, I, I fundamentally see that happening, you know, now in real time. And it's, I think it's less about mitigating the damage done to the industry than it is about sort of, you know, having a more flexible position, right? Is that they, travel suppliers need to adopt technology so that they can be more flexible so that if something like this happens again or or if recovery is slower than expected that they can somehow manage to to at least break even for a while so yeah software you know especially software that drives efficiency that 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 drives productivity automation i mean that's all um becoming more and more interesting and more hot so we should see overall i think What's the cascade effect of that? Over time, what that means is that more and more companies will be used to using software so that they'll be comparing things, they'll be trialing things and testing. And, and I think that's just generally good for all of us. <clears throat> we have another question in the Q&A from Sarah Vandell. What can Hawaii do to attract the nomadic remote worker? It's something I've been thinking about a lot as well. So I'm curious uh, your answer. Uh, second part. Does the government have a role to play in this? <laughs> Depends <laughs> if you want them to. Yeah, right. The, the, the double-edged sword of government involvement here. Yeah, you know, what can Hawaii do to attract the nomadic remote worker? I mean, it, it's um, from a product perspective, right? I, I think that the the you know. The, the Airbnb world, right? The Sonder world, the, the alternative accommodations, um, you know, vacation rental world is best positioned to market that segment. And, and maybe, maybe the Hawaii Visitor Bureau and other marketing agencies in Hawaii can start thinking about <clears throat> how do you communicate this as a product option, right? And, and if you you know, but, but a hotel room is not necessarily a great place for a nomadic remote worker. In fact, that would be pretty dreary. <laughs> yeah, 
but you know, a, a studio apartment with a desk in it has to have great Wi-Fi, maybe a large screen that's ready to be plugged in for Zoom calls. Um, that could be pretty cool. And I bet you there are a lot of people around the world who would not mind, you know, spending four months in Hawaii doing their job. I'm sure there are many people who would. So, you know, somehow communicating, especially to the, to the you know, U.S. mainland traveler, you know, the benefits of that time difference, right? Imagine getting up at five in the morning and being done with your work and time to go and enjoy an entire afternoon. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting ways that it could be played and positioned. But from a product perspective, I think it would be that vacation rental product category. Yeah. I mean, I'm already getting ad feed <laughs> for, you know, come work in Barbados, you know, nomadic work. Yeah. Advertisement. So people are jumping on, on that opportunity. Uh, I think Hawaii should too. That's just my opinion. Okay. I yeah. see um, Jetsy has a question. I'm going to unmute you. Jetsy, go ahead. So hi, my name is Shama Zehra and I'm the founder of Jetsy. We are also a tech startup, mainly we've created a social platform to connect people who love to travel so that they can have more authentic experience connecting with the locals. It's more of, uh, you know, people who share recommendations and the next step for us is to build partnerships with, actually we're talking to somebody, uh, one of the investors of Saunders, so you kept mentioning Saunders and we're building a partnership with Airbnb as well. So my question is that you must be following the, the trends very carefully. And uh, it would be very, uh, you talked about it a little bit, but it would be great to, uh, to understand a bit more what you're seeing versus you know, just the preference of travelers. Like, is it more, you're seeing it's more private flights or you know private planes versus commercial jets or more road trips versus uh, air, air flights. <coughs> rental so and in those pockets do you see that there would be opportunities popping up for for some alternative form of businesses other than the tech startups yeah um you know we certainly see drive to markets being the first markets that are going to recover here right and so you know is there opportunity to innovate around what it means to to be a drive to market and, and how to capture that for sure Right, there's obviously been a huge surge of trial in outdoor experiences. Um, you know, RV rentals are off the off the hook, and I've seen some companies that are, you know, working on sort of premium RV sharing platforms, and some people who are looking at doing entire RV packages that would include national park access areas. And, you know what I mean? So, so people are starting to creatively think about how do we productize some of these different types of experiences because there's a surge of trial. And I guess the bet being is that after people have tried something uh, once, a very large percentage of them will say, that was really fun, let's do it again. And in that very, you know, that, what, that could be the case. So, you know, I would think about, you know, what is this during the next six months you know, we're, we're sort of forcing the whole market to behave in a different way to have certain types of experiences and, you know, which of those experiences may lead to a sustained new thread of business. I think it's too early to say, I mean, we can, we can guess about it, but I also really do believe that there is just a massive pent up desire to go back to the places people have always aspired to go. And that once we have a vaccine and frankly once we have an election <laughs> once we have true treatment and a vaccine it won't take long for the walls to come down whether they're torn down <laughs> by people who are just dying to get to venice <laughs> or you know or who all lie or whatever it may be um, but i think that there will be a surge in return to the places that you know um, were aspirational before because they were for a reason. Um, but, you know, again, everybody's just guessing at this point. I do think that the drive to markets and the, and the outdoor experience markets are super interesting. I have a ton of friends who rented RVs this summer and have just gone, you know, traipsing around the Western United States and they're having a blast. Yeah. Go figure. Oh, yeah, just a follow up to that is that What's your take on the private plane industry, the private charter? That that we've heard also has gone up quite a bit. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm sure that it has. And, 
it's just not that big. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, it, you know, it, and the, the, the private plane market has been trying to innovate for a number of years. And there, there have been different models for trying to, you know, last minute sell deadhead capacity and, and create um, membership clubs where people could, you know, join and, and get flights cheaper. I think fundamentally the problem is that it's expensive. In the end of the day, you just can't take the cost out of, you know, a G4. <laughs> so, and it just has so much capacity. So, you know, people just, yes, there's a high degree of concentration of wealth in the world, but unfortunately it's concentrated among a very few people. So I, I just don't see those as necessarily large categories of business, at least from an investor's perspective, it's hard for me to imagine solutions there that would ultimately be big enough to merit venture investment. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the ideas that can be created around that category are bad, by the way. Venture isn't, you know, there are many other sources of capital for great ideas, so. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, a question on the Q&A from Albert, specifically to the tours and activities sector post COVID. What do you think is going to change there? I mean, what'll probably change most is the people who run and operate the activities. <laughs> You know, it's sort of like in San Francisco, right? People are expecting half, if not more, of the restaurants in San Francisco are going to close, right? Because how do you survive this when you're shut down for six months in a business that really is cash flow driven? So let's just play that out and say, okay, well, what happens to all of that real estate? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a coffee shop. It's got vented hoods. It's, it's a coffee shop somebody is going to sign a lease to run a coffee shop in there as the restrictions are lifted. So that original coffee shop owner may tape it up and, and move on and, and you know lick their wounds, but it's a low barrier to entry business that will be backfilled by many others. And I would argue that every restaurant location, every storefront in San Francisco that is a restaurant five years from now will be a restaurant again. It just may be a different operator signing the lease. Now, Tours and activities are probably going to be much the same because, you know, those are, are the kinds of things that people want to do when they travel. So if the leisure travel comes back en masse, they're going to want to do those things. You know, whether those operators now who have the rights and the, you know, and the monopolies on those particular experiences can survive and be the ones to, you know, to harvest the comeback of the opportunity remains to be seen. It's not clear that that'll happen. But you know, imagine that every, um, you know, bad example, but you know, every dr drive around the island in a little van operator in the state of Hawaii goes out of business and sells all their vans, somebody else is gonna come and fill that vacant spot when the demand comes back. And I don't think necessarily, I know this is me and I could be completely wrong, but I do not believe five years from now that we're all going to be wearing masks and sitting six feet apart. I think we're all going to be sitting around going, do you remember when we all wore masks and had to sit six feet apart? Wasn't that a trip? Seems like it was yesterday. I mean, honestly, I think humans are so adaptable. And as soon as this is over, we are going to swing back fast. I mean, shit, we're seeing it happen in Florida and they're still full of virus. <laughs> so, like, What happens when it's really gone? <clears throat> then again, that's Florida. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, we have a question from uh, our friend Jim Wyvin. Jim, I'm also, uh, open up your mic if you wanna ask it live. Um, if not, I can ask your question here. Okay, I can ask the question. Uh, yeah, uh, Chris, I'm kind of interested in the macro picture of Hawaii's tourism industry. People are talking about, oh, you know, we exceeded carrying capacity going to 10 million visitors a year. And with this reset that we're uh, facing, can we restructure the industry to be less people, but achieve similar revenues? And I'd just like to hear your comments on, on, that, thing, on that notion because it's going around a lot. That's interesting. 
I mean, it, <clears throat> it seems logical on the one hand, right, as, as Lyft is dramatically undermined. I mean, the airline industry, as you can imagine, is just decimated. Then again, the old, you know, run across the pond is one of the most profitable runs that the carriers have. So it is, you know, very light, likely that they will add back capacity in the future to the extent that they can. Um, I think some of the challenges that, you know, a lot of these big convention hotels that we have in Hawaii, especially in Honolulu, but also over in Maui and the Big Island, I mean, they have thrived on the big, you know, 500 room, um, you know, annual event for cardiac surgeons and, you know, Dow Chemical franchisees <laughs> and whatever for, for decades, for, for our entire adult lives. That's been a driver of, of business demand. So in, in the, you know, in a time when that business isn't coming in and leisure is coming back, who is going to tell them not to dump price? And I think that they will. And, you know, you advertise, you know, five night packages, seven night packages at just absurdly low ADRs across the world, across the United States in particular, you know, you're going to be going in the opposite direction and trying to just fill those rooms with bargain hunters. I mean, that's a real risk because in the end of the day for, a, you know, a seven to 10 day stay in the state of Hawaii, you know, for a couple, the variable on the airline price isn't really the thing that kills them as much as, um, you know, the ADR, the average daily rate on the hotel or accommodation that they stay in. But I mean, I do agree that there, look, if, if Hawaii were to take advantage of the moment, it would be to, to reflect on what it felt like to be in a state of true over tourism, right? And we talked about that, I think, at your conference. You know, we talked about over tourism and sustainability, um, and it is an opportunity to now address that. We, you know, you 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 read about Venice addressing that and saying, okay, never again. How, how do we not go back to where we were? Um, and there are strategies to do that. There are definite strategies to do that, but it takes leadership. There's no doubt about it. So, you know, in the absence of the leadership. If you just leave the gates open and you let economics drive it, absolutely Hawaii will be right back to where it was and probably with a lower end traveler initially because everybody will be dumping rate and it could be a shit show, pardon the French. So, <clears throat> you know, what we, <laughs> sorry, do you have to edit that out now? <laughs> no, 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 I don't mind the swearing. I just don't want that to happen. I know. Well, I mean, so, so how do you, you know, what, what do you have to do, you know, from, from a leadership perspective to, to prevent that and protect against it? It's a tough question. I don't think it's an easy answer because, you know, there's a lot, a lot of that real estate um, is, is not going to be too sympathetic to the problem, right? A lot of the big hotels in the state of Hawaii are, are owned by people who don't live in Hawaii. And they are economic animals. And they're, so unless there's some sort of regulatory you know, where you can't go out and just dump rate and fill your hotel with 5,000, you know, tourists from Columbus. You know, what's going to happen? Yikes. Yeah. Um, all right. I know Andrew Fowers from Shaka Guide has a question. Andrew, I'm going to unmute you as well if you want to ask it live. If not, I can read it for you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I have a question here. In terms of the travel OTA industry, uh, just curious, who is going to be the winners and the losers come post-COVID? Um, you know, what type of vertical, horizontal, uh, you know, con uh, excuse me, con the uh, consolidation, right, right, consolidation, right. <clears throat> what type of yep. Consolidation is going to be taking place moving forward. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's the million dollar question. I mean, I think that, um, I think that OTA, it's interesting, right? Because OTAs historically have been the, the you know, the, the bane of the hotel industry, right? Hotels in particular always just, you know, talk down OTAs because their commissions are so high and they frustrate them and OTA, OTAs battle for brand. Right now, OTAs are their best friend, right? If an OTA can send them traffic, uh, I mean, again, you have to you have to think about an empty hotel. <laughs> I 
you know, when you're running it at 45% occupancy and somebody shows up and says, well, I can bring you customers. You're just going to have to pay me a commission, but if you don't want them, that's okay. You know, what's going to happen, right? So OTAs are likely to do well, frankly, as the leisure um, travel market begins to recover. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that they will be aggressively leaning into taking an outsized share of that recovered traveler, you know, of that demand. As far as consolidation, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, when I have had conversations with, with the bigger, you know, the Expedias and the, and the bookings of the world, there definitely is an intense refocusing on their core business because of, you know, naturally they've been absolutely destroyed by this just like everybody else. So you would imagine in recovery, they're going to be very focused on their core business. Not clear that they will be aggressively acquiring things that are, 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 are not core. So I don't, I don't know how, how it'll play out. Um, maybe once recovery is really clear, in 2022-ish, um, it could be a different ball game. But I'm sure there are many other perspectives on, on that one. I, you, you know, probably investment bankers would have one point of view, um, players in the industry another. Thank you. How much more consolidation we can have in the OTA space. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, a question on the Q&A from Sean DeFridis. Do you see virtual reality playing a significant role in driving the digital transformation? You know, not, not necessarily in travel. Um, I don't think people are going to um, necessarily select a, a virtual reality experience over a reality reality experience. It, you know, could it have an influence on, on trial and discovery and inspiration in travel? Sure. I mean, and it could play a big role in destination management um, and how they communicate, you know, experiences and so forth. But I think virtual reality and, and augmented reality in particular are, are far more likely to play fundamental roles in, um, in, in, you know, in manufacturing and healthcare and industrial design and frankly, smart cities of the future and transportation than necessarily travel. I have a couple questions here about Sonder and what they have been doing well during this crisis. So I don't know if you <clears throat> yeah, so I think, you know, that's been a really interesting phenomenon, right? Because if you know, you look at that market and the number two, three and four competitors are either gone or, or, or about to be gone, right? And then the number one competitor raises $175 million. You know, so why, what, what's going on there? So one of the things that Sonder, Sonder has done many things very, very well. But one of the things that they've done exceedingly well is they have built a, you know, a supply engine. So they're very good at aggregating supply. Sonder adds more supply per month than their competitors had in total combined, right? Not per month, but had in total. So Sonder has developed a global engine of adding and creating supply. That's number one. Number two, their CEO, Francis, is absolutely world-class. He, he is special. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about it. He's one of the great CEOs in, in this region today. He reacted quickly and managed the cost side of his business and matched it to the reality of the demand side very, very fast, which created a great deal of confidence in investors to back the winner. And then frankly, number three, I think we, we saw very quickly a movement away from hotels to this particular asset class, right? Because at least during COVID, <clears throat> you know, it's, a, it's the ultimate social distancing stay because it's a fully automated experience. You're not, you're not meeting anybody to stay in a Sonder. They made a pivot to 30 day stays and started attracting frontline service workers, frontline healthcare workers, people who were getting so stir crazy working from home that they just booked a Sonder as like an office because they were gonna you know, kill themselves if they had to stay at home with the kids any longer. And so they've, you know, they've 
recovered. They're back up to really incredibly impressive high in, uh, uh, rates of stay. And so as the trial has accelerated and they've recovered, uh, I think that the thesis is, again, more and more travelers will begin to see their assets as competitive with hotels. And when you compare Sonder assets to hotel assets, they're, you know, in many ways for travelers of, you know, family of four or even a business traveler for a long period of time, it's a better product. So what the market then I think did is as they saw those trends and they said, okay, we have a great CEO, we have a leading supply generation uh, engine, and we have this market that is beginning to now lead for trial. It's, you know, bet the winner, bet the number one horse and go, you know, double down hard on the number one player. Because coming out of COVID, the, you know, what, what do you anticipate? They will by far and away be the most dominant player in the space globally. Their number two and three and four competitors are not competing with them for supply anymore. They're picking up some of the supply that those, those guys had to let go. And so they become the de facto, you know, uh, dominant player. And then everybody does really, really well having, you know, built that business. So in a lot of, you know, you could, you could argue that part of why Sonder won is because they were winning. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I know we're at time, Chris. Uh, we didn't get to all the questions. Are there any questions that came in that you thought were interesting that you want to try to answer? <coughs> Uh, well, some, you know, so somebody asked for a, a, um, a, a take on Airbnb and said, I think it was, you know, uh, Charles said, you know, do you think Airbnb will ever return as strong as they were from the perspective of revenue, business model, and brand? And I do. I mean, I think that the, you know, Airbnb is in a really interesting position. Um, I think that the OTAs generally are vulnerable. Um, most people start their travel discovery work in search. Most people only travel twice a year. So they're not, you know, they don't necessarily have loyalty to intermediaries. Google is getting better and better and better at products that help to connect users, us travelers, with the products that they want, which are, you know, the plane they fly to the destination they're going to and the bed they sleep in, not necessarily another intermediary. So what does it take to become a sustainable OTA? It takes proprietary supply. I frankly think if you're an OTA and you've got no proprietary supply, you're just plugging in all of the existing supply, then why in 10, 20 years from now would you know, search be passing the user to an intermediary who will then ultimately find supply? So Airbnb is in a really interesting position to be you know, OTA version 2.0. And I would suspect over time, in addition to their proprietary supply, they'll start adding more and more conventional hotel supply. They'll start adding air and other forms of transportation and so forth. And they could come out as the 800 pound gorilla uh, in the travel distribution space broadly. Um, and, you know, I think they're in a strong position. Their IPO is back on. Uh, and, and, you know, the IPO market has a, just an insatiable appetite for product. So my guess is it'll be a very successful IPO. I think you could argue it's safer right now too. Um, yeah. And you know, and it's interesting, the operators, it's, it's been so, so cool to watch. When Airbnb first started, let's face it, vacation rental assets were a huge risk for travelers, right? When you booked a vacation somewhere, you held your breath until you walked through the front door, <laughs> right? But now we live in a world where operators have gotten very sophisticated and you know, just properties that are managed by an individual host now, they just, there's a whole nother level of quality and reliability and consistency. And I think Airbnb has been part of that, of the change of that, um, of that overall ecosystem. And, and now, you know, those assets are great. You know, for a lot of people, they're superior to hotels. So, you know, I think the, the Airbnb is in a good position. All right, Chris, well, we will have to let you go with that. Sorry, everyone, we didn't get to all your questions, but thank you very much for, for tuning in. Uh, we will get you Chris's slides and his email in case you wanna follow up with him about anything. Um, and again, thank you for, for tuning into our Insights for resiliency webinar series. We will have another one in two weeks, so August 3rd. 
we're going to be featuring two female founders who have gone through uh, COVID pivots and they'll be telling their stories about that. So uh, stay tuned for that webinar event and um, everybody can join me in giving a silent round of applause for Chris. I know he can't hear you, but I know you all appreciate his uh, being with us here today. Um, so again, aloha everyone and thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Bye.